So I'm on my second attempt of going to the London Motorcycle Museum. I have 12 pounds in my pocket. I have checked the website. Both the website and the Google listing say that they are open. It's Monday afternoon around 1.30. We're gonna see if I can get inside, pay my history tax. There's the school. I was interrupted by the fact that the museum was closed on my last ride to finish what I was saying about the Curtis Museum. The Curtis Museum and probably this museum are museums that are privately run and they're small collections and it's really these little museums that keep these social histories alive. So I'm hoping that this lives up to my expectations for it. There's flags out. All right. Big sign that says open. Looks encouraging. Good afternoon to you. I'm excellent. I'm very excited that you're open. <laughs> That's neat. When I first visited the London Motorcycle Museum when it was closed, I was shocked by the 12 pound entry fee that was advertised outside. I wondered where that money was spent, but after visiting and learning about the museum when it was open, 12 pounds is a bargain. The museum houses the Crosby Collection, which displays nearly 200 bikes, sidecars, and various displays. It's unclear how long the museum will remain open or in its current location, which is unfortunate. The museum is under threat. Due to the local council imposing increasing pressure on the museum, and trying to reacquire the property on which it is housed. Currently, the council requires museum, which is a registered charity, to pay in excess of £40,000 a year in various fees. This is independent of insurance and other operating costs, and even at £12 per person, the museum is unable to meet these financial burdens. They are currently looking for other space in London, but looking is hard and slow and rehousing the collection might be impossible. I am not going to showcase individual items in the collection because you all should go and visit this museum yourselves. It's about five miles from the Ace Cafe, so you can bundle the two if you're coming from afar. One of the displays I will note is a round-the-world Enfield. The owner had terminal cancer. And he purchased the Enfield for a round-the-world trip. He quit his job, he invested in this trip, and he ended up living abroad years beyond his life expectancy. The museum displays not only the bike, but other artifacts from the trip, as well as an account, newspaper articles, and maps. The bike still has water bottles filled with water from the trip, and the museum also allows the bike to leak oil in pride of place. Earliest bikes date from 1902. They have Sunbeams, Excelsiors, Nortons, Vincents, Bruff Superiors, Matchless, AJS. Bikes that have been used in film and television, as well as a Frankenstein bike that has a Austin automobile engine housed in a Norton frame. There are small displays for race bikes, military bikes, work bikes, and emergency services bikes. The museum houses the entire racing trophy collection of deceased English Grand Prix motorcycle and short circuit road racer Derek Minter, who was an active racer between 1955 and 1967. Out back of the deceptively huge property hides an old barn and storehouses revealing the agricultural history of the land. The museum had ambitious plans which are now impossible to include acquiring some more bikes, as well as accommodating meets and events at the museum. The large barn out back is designated to the museum's massive and admirable Triumph collection of motorcycles and factory tools and memorabilia. As dealers for Triumph prior to the closing of the original factory, the family was in a strategic position to rescue some of the bikes and fixtures from the manufacturing facility.
Their earliest triumph in the barn is a barn find from 1906. I was accompanied on my visit by the owner's son who gave me a personal tour of the museum. I don't think this was unique to my visit. I think he does this for anyone who visits. He was extremely knowledgeable and had insight and provenance for each and every item in the collection. I was surprised by the personal attention, but again, I think he does this for everyone who walks through the door. Something to note regarding the Triumph collection, many of the bikes are new or never ridden. This is unique to this collection. Having bikes like these are vital resources to those people trying to restore their own bikes, as most larger museums display restored bikes themselves, which often have incorrect colors and huge lashes of chrome, which were not available due to the nickel shortage in Russia at the time of the manufacture of these bikes. The Triumph collection has bikes from across the years up to the 1980s when they finally closed. For me, the jewels of the collection are the two factory-produced cutaway bikes. You can sometimes find the odd cutaway engine that some important dealers would have been given by the factory as countertop novelties to show the workings and the moving parts of an engine. The London Motorcycle Museum has two full cutaway bikes. One was used by Triumph for bike shows, while the other was used by the Metropolitan Police. The bike show one, I learned a fun bit of trivia. Often visitors to the bike shows would deposit trash or cigarette butts or wads of gum into the open cases of the cutaway bikes. Other visitors would carry tools and remove bolts and fasteners from the display bikes. This required the manufacturers to inventory, replace, repair, and clean the bikes and all the missing parts each night before the next day of the show. The second full cutaway bike, as I mentioned, was used by the Metropolitan Police to instruct motorcycle cops on how to repair their bikes. What makes this piece unique from the bike show piece is the motorized plinth on which it is displayed. With the flip of a switch, an elliptical roller moves the front and rear wheel, thus activating the suspension and most moving parts of the bike. It's amazing, and I want it for my living room. I can think of at least two London motorcycle destinations which are nothing more than cafe and clothing novelty shops that have the space and clientele to house at least part of this collection. Hundreds of bikers visit them each week, and I wish that this little museum could share in that foot traffic and enthusiasm. I would argue that these glorified restaurant gift shops could help rescue and house at least a selection of the London Motorcycle Museum's collection and immediately increase the foot traffic and profiles of each organization. More importantly, motorcyclists would finally have a destination that meets all of their desires for a ride's end. In the meantime, and while you still can, do yourself a favor and do the museum a favor and visit the London Motorcycle Museum in Greenford and give your 12 quid. If you like that video and you want to see more like them, hit like, share, and subscribe.